I guess before I start, I want to give some credit to the scans from this past week, this past chapter 968, because they were actually pretty good when I compared it to the Viz. Um, there were no glaring differences. Of course, there was different sayings that were, I don't know, minuscule, but nothing major where the translation completely misread what was being said. So shout out to the scans from this past week. That was the only reason why I didn't make a video once the chapter came out like a day and a half ago or so. So I wanted to give it some time. I wanted to give it some time because of the last chapter in which the scans were so bad where a lot of context was lost and this chapter and this scan comparing it to the viz again they were actually really good so shout out to the scans again i read the scans whenever they come out but i also read the viz going forward once the scans come out i will drop a video based on the scans and then drop an analysis based on the viz so without further ado let's get into the chapter quickly on the cover page it's still a capone gang page stuff with chiffon and lola that entire thing i'm not as invested anymore because it's been going on for too long so let's just get right to the chapter the roger pirates knew roger was sick at the end of the day they knew he was gonna die but shanks you know stumbled upon him and he was coughing and you could tell that it was really affecting him and we see at the beginning of the chapter here he asked roger something and then he started crying like a baby uh what that question is i don't know maybe exactly when are you gonna die are you really going to die because again shanks has been on the crew for such a long time that's like his dad at this point a father figure he's extremely young is going to hit him very hard and in this situation i don't think youth matters like if that's your partner or if that's somebody that you care about a crewmate is going to impact you when they tell you that they are going to die they talked about the effect that roger finding the one piece had on the world something i said before was that okay well what was the proof that roger actually found the one piece i guess for a lot of people they wanted to find the treasure that people said he he had and everything that roger gained they were calling it the one piece and because of that now everyone is going after roger i believe the smart pirates were the ones that actually faced roger before and understand just how much of a monster he was but these pirates these naive newcomers trying to make a name for themselves they all feel like they can take out roger and take the treasure they were the people going after roger of course you know ignorance is bliss you don't know what roger can do so of course you're just going to go after him and expect to come out on top i guess we knew this but in the newspaper they're saying the man that achieved wealth power and fame they were calling him the pirate king gold roger but then roger said no my name is goldie roger the king of the pirates i guess it has a nice ring to it. they're now speaking from the perspective of knowing what the what the one piece is well not what the one piece is because the one piece was what roger's fame or what roger's treasure was they now know what the treasure that joy boy left behind was like the meaning to it all they know the history of everything so now they're saying well we understand why the world government would hide your name because obviously the d means something really significant to the world government and to the, the history of the world in general so they have to hide that they don't want to publicize that this chapter i think is drowned in like sentimentalism it's not going to procure the same emotions it would if the straw hats were disbanding like if luffy came to everyone and said hey i'm about to die i'm going to be the first one to get off the ship that would hit us a lot more because we've been following them for so long it's something that just came to me like what would happen if Zoro was the last person on the ship would he be stuck on the sea forever like how would that go anyway the emotion you felt it because roger sat everyone down and said yo i just want to take the time out to let you guys know this has been a miracle because think about it he told them he was about to die he had to get a doctor he had to find odin battle whitebeard all these things had to fall in place he had to find all the world poneglyphs he had to i mean he went to lodestar that was in the final island all this happened after i told you guys i was i was gonna die so thank you you know it's, it's just like after something achieving something great and you're in a great like in a company or in a group the leader per se of the group would come around and let everyone know how much they did a great job that's what roger's doing here but of course they've been together for so much longer than you know a regular group so it's much more impact and they're like oh roger what are you talking about man like it's all this emotion and it's funny because it's the contrast to like what happened next in which he disbands the roger pirates but the most important thing i think from this chapter is what was happening under the sea and i'm gonna read it like verbatim because i think Everyone can come to their own conclusion, but once you hear exactly what's said, I think it's pretty clear what's going on. And these are the Seekings, or the Neptunians, whatever the fuck. The birthing is at hand. Our sovereign will soon be born, and another in a distant sea. The whales are delighted in anticipation of the day the two sovereigns shall meet again. We have been waiting for so long. It is almost here. And surely all will go well this time. Just 10 until the birth, another 15 to grow. And of course, Roger's now surprised, like, what, what the hell is going on? Like, who's talking? And then he thinks back to what Shirley told him, saying that she your Hoshi would be born in 10 years. So he says, another 10 to be born, another 15 to grow. And he says, the two sovereigns shall meet again. 
So what does this mean? I think we get more context later in the chapter, and I'll get to that once we get there. But for me, they're saying in another 10 years, Shirohoshi will be born. And in 15 years, you know, she will grow up and then she will probably have that moment in which she's ready to lead the Sea Kings or ready to exude that power or inherit that power. The key part here is when they said the day of the two sovereigns shall meet again, which means that this is something that's continued throughout history that whoever the king of the Neptunians are, they meet up with another sovereign. But this is a bit murky because now we get into destiny and reincarnations and things of that nature. I, I don't want to delve too deep into that because I think that's kind of throwing away exactly what One Piece is about and not actually factoring in the will of D because that's an important thing. Inherited will is important. I think this is carrying on that whole idea. But I, I think a, a video should be dedicated to this in regards to just talking about what this actually means in the context of Fishman Island, what Robin talked about, what Rayleigh talked about. It's a lot that we can piece together, even going back to Skypea. Joy Boy is really important with this. I think that entire page or that contextual passage is important for the end game of the series. And then now it makes a lot more sense with um, Oda actually saying, I don't want to continue this flashback too long because I fear I might reveal things that I don't want to, I'm not ready to yet, which is funny at 968, but that's what Oda said. Something that also, you know, struck me was when Roger said, hey, we were just too early. Um, and then, of course, the cool panel in which he says, you know, my son will find it. And he's like, you don't have one. And he's like, I will eventually. And, you know, knowing what happens next, it's, um, it's sad to think about. Again, sentimentalism. I really wonder what Roger said to Rayleigh to make him break down like that. Maybe, you know, it's like, hey, partner, you know, I know we've been together for a while. I know that, you know, we've had uh, some amazing journeys, but I'm not going to die. You know, he had that moment with Rayleigh. We had it. We saw it in anime or in the manga in the anime, right? Where he, you know, they're in the bar, really had the flashback. It was in the manga as well, but they're in the bar and Roger tells him, hey, partner, I'm not going to die. That's why I said youth doesn't matter because someone that you care about, knowing that they're going to die, that this was the last time you would experience their, you know, breath, touch, presence in general, it's sad. That's why I guess when people meet Luffy and he reminds him so much of Gold Roger, it's so refreshing because it brings you back to that moment, that that nostalgia of, you know, this guy has the same air as my captain. So I want to help him and see him succeed as much as possible. So he left the ship with medicine. They said the disease was in its final stages. Sounds like cancer at this point because he was terminally ill. I mean, we don't know some disease, but whatever. Talking about the crew and how they were saying, you know, what's up with all this emotion? They were all bawling like they were all crying like heavy tears with Roger because, you know, he's just walking away like, yay, hey, you know, this is probably the last time a lot of them would see them, would see him. But I like the fact that he said he would go find Whitebeard. I mean, the whole Izo thinks they're in a Whitebeard ship. We know that happened because Izo is still on Whitebeard's or one of Whitebeard's commanders. But going to find Whitebeard is important here because he's like, whatever I figured out, I want to shear with Whitebeard beard you know and again through their battles on the seas for so long it's just mutual respect there so for him he wanted to go and you know have that final talk it's just like everything coming full circle for roger his final moments that's how he wanted it to go it's all great to see play out like and it's surreal because again this is the end game of roger's journey and we feel like the parallel is there with luffy's i don't think it's going to go that way at all because luffy he's not too early right so showing us this doesn't spoil anything it just gives context we got so much information from the roger stuff and like the disbanding of the roger pirates the whole sea king stuff and the sovereigns meeting the wano part was heavy with dialogue first off toki i think toki so far has been one of those characters that shows that she's a great support system i know people out there that they don't enjoy what toki brings to the story but i feel like toki is the embodiment of someone that wants to support a great man because they said after odin left which you know i have some qualms not qualms with that but just some things that I want to talk about in regards to like Odin leaving Wano and then things he had to say about it. Pretty much Toki held it down and everything she did was to make sure that people didn't forget Odin was and what Odin represented. And because of Toki, people didn't forget Odin. She didn't feed into the fact that she was the wife of the daimyo and the next shogun. She was not pompous or arrogant. She went down, she worked with everyone and she told everyone what Odin was experiencing. And because of this, people, you know, love Odin and they accept Odin not being there right now because of what he's doing and what he what he would bring to the people of Wano. I think another part of it is that Wano is going through such a tumultuous time with Orochi. He's like the pillar of hope for everyone. So it's like, you know what? We're going to believe in this guy regardless. 
So I think that helped Odin that Orochi was so terrible and all the things that, that was happening in Wano at the time. So Toki, I think, you know, she's great. I understand we're in this era of, you know, female empowerment and women should be strong and do anything on their own independence. People would like if Toki left Odin, right, and left Wano and said, you know what, I don't want to wait around for a man. People are like, oh my God, Toki is so amazing. But with her holding him down and being a great support system and actually helping the people of Wano because they needed it at that point, they needed a pillar of hope, but they're not going to look at that, right? That's not going to be important to them. It's all about bullshit. But I think Toki's been great. I think this is great characterization for her because strength can manifest in different ways. Um, I do think that the regurgitation of the same thing and the same depiction of women can become stale in a manga or a series. But I feel like sometimes, and it's hard to do this, removing previous bias and understanding what's being shown at the time and how impactful and important it is deepens your experience. It makes the story better and easier to enjoy. Um, but again, a lot of people can't do that. Tangent, but I just felt like it, I, it had to be said. Tokyo had been a topic of a discussion for a while, but now I, I enjoy everything she did here for Odin. It was great. Everything that we knew from Orochi's slight flashback with the old hag and them tricking Sukiyaki, it's all coming to us in a different manner this time because Odin is surprised like Orochi's my best guy like what he's like a brother to me when did that happen I lent him money for Yasu because I cared about Yasu but Odin was able to pick up on certain things the fact that Ashra Doji and Dendro they were doing different things to kind of keep Korea afloat or Wano afloat in general he was like well that's not the sign of a healthy country and then he talked about the factories being built and Orochi just being being a scumbag in general and then you know Kaido's brought up and that's something everybody's been anticipating because Kaido again occupying Wano is a huge deal and we wanted to see exactly how did that happen? It seems like Orochi and Kaido, they're obviously already working together. So we're not going to see the, I don't know, the beginning stages of that. We'd have to go backwards to see that. And maybe it's thrown in there or maybe it's talked about once we meet Kaido and Orochi um, after this chapter. Well, I get to the end, but maybe it's talked about at some point. They talked about the execution of a family because someone refused to work. And then, you know, the scabbards, they went to kind of change things. And those people, well, Kaido's men took that opportunity to go into the castle and they threatened Momonosuke. Some W's to be given out, Kawamatsu and Inarashi, they were guarding the castle and they, you know, took care of Kaido's men. So they protected Toki and her family. However, you know, arrows were raining down and it struck Toki in her leg. And Kinemon, he's apologizing to Odin for all this happening. I guess it's showing just how loyal and how much of a good guy Kinemon is. Odin didn't abandon his country, but one could say he gave into his selfish ideals, meaning he was so hell bent on leaving Wano and finding out things to, to kind of satisfy his own being. The people and the well-being of Wano was not you know, of the utmost importance. Like he just wanted to leave Wano. Again, ultimately his journey will benefit Wano, but at the time it was just about him leaving Wano. So for them and all the sacrifices that they are making and they made, and now they're bowing to him and, you know, apologizing, they're really good people. He has a really, an extremely great support system. And I think that's part of the reason why he got so upset because he understands the sacrifice they had to make for those years. And now knowing everything they went through, but then, you know, when he went back to Wano, he realized like, this is a different country. I, I have to like leave now because this country has changed. But again, he was on a mission with Roger. Now it's over. Now I'm here. Let's fix it. One of my favorite moments of the chapter is when he looks at Toki's leg and you see the arrow and the scar there. Toki calls everything that happened trivial. And Odin's like, you really don't know about me, right? You don't know the stories about me and my past because Odin is a hothead back in the day. He went and he liberated Kuri by himself. Odin, he's, this is not new to him. And I think it was funny because Orochi then remembered like, oh man, this guy is crazy. And seeing Enma and Abe no Habikiri was really cool because he's like, all right, I I'll be back. And for him, it didn't matter. He was like, I don't know the ins and outs and everything about the story. But all I know is that a fool has taken control of Wano. So Odin goes to find Orochi, cuts down everyone in his path and he meets Orochi and Orochi's like, well, yo, think about what's happening, right? Don't, just don't do any rash thing. And he's about to say Lord Odin. And he just says, he's like, I mean, Odin, right? Because he's like, I'm the Shogun now, technically. And he said, Kaido's not going to like it if you attack me. And Odin's like, bro, you think I care about Kaido? I'll worry about that after I cut you in two. And the chapter ends. One thing about this chapter that was really cool was that it's building that hype and that anticipation of Odin versus Kaido. I don't know how much of it we're going to see. However, this is going to be fantastic. In my opinion, I expect it to be really, really good. Like, I think next chapter could be another legendary chapter. This chapter wasn't bad. I think this chapter was really, really good because it leads to, uh, it 
I feel like it kind of gives us some conclusive evidence of what's to come. The Joy Boy thing, I think it's a lot to it. I promise a video is coming on that. But overall, we're going to see exactly what happens here because something to keep in mind, nothing major can happen right now because Odin doesn't die for another five years or so. So unless Kaido wasn't there in Wano at the time and he comes back five years later, Odin, Kaido and Orochi, they were occupying each other's space for quite a while. So I'll make a video about that as well. Just give my thoughts on what happened or what happens. But it's great. Very good chapter. Again, shout out to the scans. <laughs> they did a great job. If you read the scans, I implore you to also read the viz to get a, I guess a, a better view of what happened because the scans are a bit more raw while the viz, it's a lot more streamlined, right? Like the speech, you can tell it's a, a bit more formal. Like they want it to be as easy to win the point of the viz is to make it as easy as possible to understand so shout out to the translator steven for being amazing so that's about it guys let me know your thoughts how do you feel about this chapter what are your thoughts on what was going on with the sea kings roger and the pirates disbanding and orochi in general that entire sequence with orochi odin how do you feel about that all amazing stuff guys give me your thoughts again like the video if you did subscribe to the channel for more content like this follow me on twitter at Ace. follow me on instagram at bragody.ace thank you guys so much for your support shout out to my patrons i appreciate you guys so much again like subscribe. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.